Hey, great afternoon, church. How are we doing? Well, fantastic. If you've got your Bibles, Mark chapter 12, uh, we're going to be uh, continuing in the sermon series, obviously, on love. And um, in Mark chapter 12, we see what is known as, and what we've been talking about, is the great commandment. The great commandment that Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his response uh, in verse 29 of Mark chapter 12, Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And uh, last week, as Paul said, we talked about faithfulness, or we talked about what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, meaning to love God and be faithful and walk in faithful obedience to him. Uh, And then this week, we're talking about what does it mean to love the Lord with all your soul? And if Loving God with all our heart includes a faithful obedience. Loving God with all our soul includes entrusting that soul to him. And the question we have for today, and that you should be asking yourself, is to whom or to what have I entrusted my soul to? We read and we see a couple things in the Bible uh, about what the Bible says about the soul. And the first is that our soul is the place from which we worship. Our soul is the place from which we make much of, with which we magnify, which we glorify. In Luke chapter 146, Mary when she was praising Jesus in Luke chapter 146, it said, Mary said, "My soul magnifies the Lord." In Psalm 103.1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Right? 10,000 reasons. The song that we sing, Bless the Lord, O my soul, comes from that place of where true worship comes from. It doesn't just come from the lips. It doesn't just come from the mind or from our bodies. True worship comes from the soul. The soul is also the place of our emotions. We see in the Psalms constantly, uh, why are you so downcast, oh my soul, my soul is very sorrowful, or my soul overjoices. The Psalms are filled with our soul and emotions that we feel, and in Matthew 26, 38, Jesus has a soul, and Jesus said uh, to his disciples, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death, remain here and watch with me, that's when he was about to be crucified, Jesus himself said, my soul is very sorrowful, so sorrowful is it, it, it's almost until, uh, uh, up until death, and so the soul is our place of emotion. Number three, the soul has to do with who we are. The soul has to do with our identity. In Acts chapter 241, we read, after Peter preached and people were saved, we read, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Not just people, not just bodies, not just minds, but added were 3,000 souls. When a pilot is on a flight, and he's referring to the passengers that he's in charge of to take from one place to another, and especially in an emergency. When he talks about those passengers, he says, I have this many souls on this flight. Not just this many people, not just this many bodies, I have this many souls. And we understand that we are much more than just a physical body. We understand that we have emotions and we have desires and we have an identity. We understand that we have a soul. And lastly, our soul is eternal. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, And do not fear those, Jesus said, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And in James 20, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The question is not whether you or I live in eternity. The question is where do we live in eternity? Our soul is the place of worship, the place of emotion, the place of identity, and it is an internal uh, soul. 
And for us then to be able to look and see what does it mean when Jesus says, love me, right? The greatest commandment, love me with all you've got. Well, what does it mean to love him with all of our soul? Because to love him with our heart means we are faithful to him in all aspects of life. But to love him with our soul, it means we have entrusted our soul, our very selves to him. It means we have trusted our worship to Jesus. It means we've trusted our emotions to Jesus. It means we've trusted our identity to Jesus. And it means we've trusted our salvation or our life to Jesus. And in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, we see the second of the Ten Great Commandments. And the second of the Ten Great Commandments says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, some of your Bibles will save an idol, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord... Your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The second commandment has to do with love. And he's going, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not worship anything besides me. The first one is, I am the Lord. Entrust yourself to me. Be faithful to me. Love me with all your heart. The second is, I am the Lord, and so worship me. Entrust your soul to me. There's nothing that you raise up that this is what will worship. No, he's going, entrust yourself. And what is the, what, what's the issue at hand? Because I am a jealous God. I am a God who is zealous for his name to be magnified. I am a God who will not be second. I am a God who will not have those that hate. And the question is, do we love him enough to worship and to entrust our souls to him? And I think Romans 1 answers that question very well. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and here's the part, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so God's going in the second commandment, worship me and nothing else, have no idols. And then Romans 1 says, what did people do? They exchanged the image of the glorious God, the eternal God, the creator, and said, we're not going to worship you. We're going to worship something else. That is the sin that we break when we break the second commandment. The question is not, are you going to worship or are you not going to worship? We are created to worship. We are created to make much of. We are created to exalt the question is, what are we worshiping? What are we exalting? And you know what Romans 1 does? It says, we don't want God. There's something better. Jesus, we don't want you. The riches of this world are better. Jesus, we don't want you. The success I can have here is better. Jesus, we don't want you. The relationship that I've cultivated and built here is better. Jesus, we don't want you. This part of earth or this part of life or this part of what I'm going through, this is better than you. And look at what Romans 1, look at what the people did. They, they, they didn't stop worshiping. Right? It's not like God's going, worship me, and they're like, no, we're not going to, because we can't stop worshiping. We need to worship something. And so what do they do? They go, we're not going to worship God, but instead we're going to make much of this. And that can be a person, that can be a career, that can be a family, that can be good things in their place, but we've exalted them to the place of God. Because we think it's better than Jesus. And now, none of us are gonna flatly say, yeah, I think this is better than Jesus. And yet people live it out every day, worshiping created things rather than the creator God. And so they entrust themselves to these things and they go, this, I'll worship this because it will bring me joy, it will bring me satisfaction, and it will bring me 
peace. Sin is not just a behavior issue. Sin is a worship issue. What are some of the idols? Because for us, we might think it's foolish, and it, it certainly is foolish when people create something with their hands and begin worshiping an image or a statue or whatever. But yet for us, we do the same thing on the spiritual level. Or we don't want Jesus, we want whatever it is beside him that we think will build up my emotions to the correct place, build up my identity, and build up my life. And so the question is, who have we entrusted our souls to? Who do we worship? Because if we say that we are to love Jesus with all our soul, it means that we love him with our, all our soul by entrusting, entrusting him in our worship. We love Jesus with all our soul by trusting him in our worship. Worship is not just what we sang the past 30 minutes or what we did the past 30 minutes. That last song at the end, um, I don't know how you listen to music. I listen to music one song at a time, kill it, and then find another song, and then come back to it like five years <laughs> down the road, right? So it's on repeat. Uh, that last song is on repeat starting this week, right? Um, but worship is not just music. It's not just singing. It's not just praising God. That is an aspect of worship. Worship is not even this service. Although this is a worship service, we have come here to make much of Jesus, to glorify him, to exalt his name. Yes, we've come here to worship, but that's not all that it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, it Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Whatever you do, even the most minute details of eating and drinking, wherever you are in your life, do it for the glory of God. Meaning I live my life in such a way that I make the most and point to the most of who Jesus is. In all aspects, worship at the very foundation is making much of Jesus. Now, that's why we say we don't ever stop worshiping because some of us have taken Jesus off of the rightful place of worship and placed something else there. And so then my life begins to revolve and my worship begins to revolve around this. And so who do you make much of? Who does your life revolve around? Because to love Jesus with all your soul means to entrust your worship to him. Because that which we worship or that which we make much of, we think that ultimately that's where life is. We think that ultimately that's where joy is. We think that ultimately that's where peace is. And we think that ultimately that's where satisfaction is. And so that's why the second part to love Jesus with all your soul is number one, to worship him. Number two, to trust him with your emotions. In Psalm 43, and if you want to flip with me, because we're going to cover for the five verses of this psalm. In Psalm 43, the psalmist says, Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. And so in verse one, he's going, Vindicate me, O God. He's going, I am being attacked. And in verse two, he's saying, I am oppressed. You ever been there? It seems for the last couple years, if it's not one thing, it's the next thing. Right, like if it's not uh, COVID, then it's something else. Then it's shortages with supply, and then it's the war in Ukraine, and then it's uh, inflation, and then it's a recession, and it always seems like there's always something else. And then for us personally, it seems like, man, just when I'm getting going, there's something else. 
Just when my marriage is beginning to stabilize and pick up, there's another argument or another tragedy that shakes the entire foundation. Just when I seem like I'm getting into it and I'm following, there's something else that comes and it seems like an attack and the psalmist is going, I am being attacked by my enemy. And in verse two, he says, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go on about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And in verse two, he's going, I find my refuge in you and you have rejected me. Think about that, talking to God like that. I have been following you and it's not working. You've been there? I, I know this is church, we're all pretty and everything's great, but have you been there? Because the psalmist certainly has. I have entrusted, I take refuge in you. You are the one I follow. You're the one who protects me. Why have you rejected me? And then he goes in verse three, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. And he turns and he goes, I entrusted myself to you and it feels like you've rejected me. It feels like it's not working. It feels like it's not helping. And what is his solution? His solution is I will go to God. I will find him and I will praise him and I will worship him. And in verse five, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. This guy seems like he doesn't have it together. Seems like he's almost two different people, right? Because in one hand, he's going, you've rejected me, but I want to go and I want to worship you. And then in verse five, he's going, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Why are you filled with sorrow? Put your hope in God. Either your emotions will lead you or you will lead your emotions. And a better way of saying that, either you will lead your emotions or your emotions will lead you. Because he's going, I feel I feel as though God has forsaken me. I feel as though he's rejected me and I feel sorrowful and I feel downcast. He goes, but I know that's not Christ. I know that's not who God is. I know that my future is secure. I know that my hope is secure. And so he's telling his soul, put your hope in God. We are so driven and our culture is so driven by emotion. Today I feel like doing this, today I don't feel like doing this. And so I'm not gonna do it. Today I got up and like, man, there's some days when you get up and you get up and everything's great and wonderful and it takes you just one like moment to talk to a coworker or somebody uh, says something that you kind of take as a personal attack and it just ruins the rest of the day. Right? And, we, and, and we've been there and we led by these things, led by our emotion. There was somebody I was reading uh, last week because they didn't like a certain decision or a certain uh, political thing. They're like, ah, no, I can't work today. I can't work today, sorry, just not, you know, it, it just had such a big impact on my emotional state. It's like, goodness, aren't we comfortable? <laughs> Our ancestors, man, sorry, can't work today, just not feeling it. Hey, can you serve here in ministry? Nah, not really feeling it. Really busy, really busy, man. Real work, school, family, just really busy. 
and we base it off of our emotion and our entire life is led by, am I feeling like I wanna do this or am I not feeling like I wanna do this? Now, emotions are not unimportant, they are very important, but the question is, who is leading? Emotions, the Bible says, and even Paul in Philippians, he writes to the church and he goes, rejoice in the Lord, and then he says, always. Philippians 4.4, 4. rejoice in the Lord always. And then he goes, again, I will say, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because you have to remind your soul. You have to remind it constantly. My salvation is secure. This is only temporary. And here's what we do. We live in our own bubble, seeing kind of what's in front of us and completely missing what God has for us. And then we wonder, why are we so downcast my soul? Why? Because I see this issue, but once it's at least a little bit resolved, then I see another issue, but we can look and go, but my eternity is secure. My salvation is secure. My life is secure. That's why God, uh, Paul, it's just, you look at his life, the apostle Paul, and you see, and this dude had every right, to be just miserable. Um, if you go, like we have a mission trip in Poland coming up. Let's say you have to sail to Poland. If you go to Poland on a boat and you get shipwrecked, you'd be a little pissed, right? Like, yeah, you survive, but you'd be a little mad. And you'd kind of start to go, and I'm going on a mission trip, taking some vacation days, paid for this thing, and now I'm shipwrecked. All right, but you make it to shore, and your little team, they start making a fire, and then a snake comes up and bites you. And you go, at one point, do you just blow up and just forget it? Forget it, not going any further, just forget all of it. And Paul, and then shipwrecked twice, and then one time shipwreck makes it to shore, probably all wet, trying to get a snake by some like, thrown in prison, all those things. And what does he go? My future is secure. My joy is secure. I will worship God. I will make much of him. Why? Because I know and I have entrusted my emotions to him. To love God with all our soul, it means we have entrusted our worship to him. It means we have entrusted our emotions to him. And third, to love Jesus with our, all our soul, it means we have trusted him with our identity. Um, from early on, you and I begin to form an identity. Very early on. And we form an identity primarily in the beginning by what our parents tell us. And then by what our extended family tells us. And then by what our friends tell us. And then by what our peers tell us or our coworkers tell us. And every time that something is said about you, you begin to form an identity of yourself, an identity of the soul. And so if these are negative things that were told to you, you begin to form a negative identity. Like if you were told, and this is not, uh, like some of you, you just kind of have this idea about yourself that you just, you're terrible, you have a terrible memory. You can't remember. Uh, and then others of us, we have this idea uh, of ourselves that it's not really our memory, um, but it's just, I'm not a good listener. Uh, and then for, uh, for, for others of us, like we've just heard it all our lives, hey, you're a klutz. Uh, you're a cl everywhere you go, you spill a drink, right? You're, you're, that's just who you are. You're, you're, you're a klutz. And we begin to, uh, very early on, begin to form these ideas about who we are. Well, I'm not a good listener. Well, I don't have a good memory. Well, I'm this and this and this. And then, sometimes, though, it's a little bit worse than that. Sometimes someone places into your soul, hey, you're really, you're ugly. Hey, really, uh, you're unlovable. Hey, really, uh, you are undesirable. Hey, really, no one wants anything to do with you. And that begins to damage 
people because we think that we've kind of recovered or we try to recover and then every once in a while it comes back and then sometimes people will put in good things or good things and we begin to build up those identities. So somebody says, hey, you're a great athlete. Somebody says, hey, you're just brilliant. Somebody says, hey, you're a great leader. And then what do we do? Like if somebody says you're a great athlete, then we begin to build up on that identity and we begin to do things because we're rewarded and we kind of get this affirmation of this is who I am. And sometimes people put in false identities. And that can be some of those negative identities. Sometimes they don't even mean it. Sometimes like you'll go in school and they'll say, hey, you're a winner. Really? Really though? I mean, all your trophies are participation trophies, man. There's sixth place. That's not a winner. All right. Uh, hey, you're really special, you're unique, you're, you're ordinary. Uh, yeah, like God made you as unique and individual, but you're not special. I mean, your mom says you're special because she thinks she's special. And it's like you kind of form an identity based on what you hear about yourself. And it's very hard once that identity is formed in the soul to be able to change it. But Jesus, in 1 Peter 2, 9, we read, but you are in Jesus, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Like the song we just sang, thank you Jesus for the blood applied. Why? Because that has transformed in the very soul of who we are. It has transformed our identity and you can entrust your soul to a million different things and they will begin to define you who you are and how you act and you will begin to live your life in that way but if you have entrusted your soul to Jesus and your identity to Jesus then you begin to go I am no longer a sinner I am a saint I am no longer walking in darkness I'm walking in the light I'm no longer just a person I am a child of God and then The Bible says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So then you can go, I am no longer this, but I am now who God has made me, who Jesus has purchased. And you can begin to live in your true identity. And whatever other outside noise comes, You're so special. No, I'm not, man. I'm a child of God. I'm beyond that special. Don't even talk to me about that. Or you are unlovable. No, the cross of Jesus proves, proves that he loves me. You begin to live out that identity. Man, I'm no longer walking as a child of darkness. I'm walking as a child of God repentfully stumbling, but I'm walking as a child of God. Our culture has such an identity crisis because, well, I kind of joked around this, but it's true. From a very young age, we tell kids that they came from monkeys and then we're surprised that 20 years later they begin acting like animals. It's like, you've been telling them (laughs) that this is their, where they came from. And the Bible is very clear. You have been created in the image of God, bought by the blood of Jesus. You are so valuable. And our culture, man, we just don't know where to get our identity. And that's why you can be everything. I don't know how many genders there are anymore. But really, there's only two because they keep switching back and forth even when they switch. <laughs> like... And it's like, you can be anything that you want. And why is that? Because they don't know who they are. We know. Why do we know? Because God has said so. 
And my identity is not rooted in anything anyone says. My identity is rooted in who God has called me. And so to love Jesus with all our soul means that we have entrusted our identity to him. And finally, to love Jesus with all our soul, it means we have trusted Jesus for our salvation. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, uh, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls comes only when you entrust it to Jesus. You can entrust to Jesus your soul. And by the way, when we're talking about soul and life, we're talking about, even when we're talking about worship, we're talking about that with, with which we most glorify. That with which we think will bring us the most that this life has to offer. And Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Not that they might just experience a little bit of life. Not that that might just have a little bit of joy or a little bit of peace, but that they might have it abundantly and full. Here's the thing, and we said this last week. Sometimes we're fine entrusting our salvation and our eternity to Jesus. Jesus got that, my eternity is secure, but we find it hard to trust our life now to him, right? So you go, eternity is somewhere in the future. I entrust that to him, but man, I've got bills, Gas is a gazillion dollars. I go to Costco now, you can't leave without spending hundreds. I've got issues, man. So I'm gonna deal with this. You, I, my eternity is secure. And I ask you, how's that going? Because you look around and entrusting your soul to anything but Jesus will lead to death, ultimately lead to death. But entrusting your soul to Jesus will lead to life, not just here, but life eternal. And let me finish with this. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says to anybody who would listen, he says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Do you wanna know how you find a soul that has no rest? It's a soul that jumps from place to place to place because it's trying to find rest. It's a restless soul. And so, man, this church doesn't work. I'm going to go across the street to a different church. Then this will, uh, finally, I'll find some rest here. Nope, nope, people are just the same here. I'm going somewhere else. No rest here. I'm going somewhere else. No, this job doesn't work. Uh, Got to go somewhere else. And, and no rest here. And I'm going here. This is going to bring me ultimate life and satisfaction. No, this spouse, man, they're just not doing it. I thought they would do it. They're not doing it. There's no rest here. Certainly restless nights. It's not working. Going to the next one. Man, that's not working. Maybe I should go to the next one. Oh, I'm going to come back to the first one. And it's jumping from place to place to place. Why? Because there's no rest for the soul. Well, maybe when I finally achieve my goals and I get my house and I get my car, but man, this house, it's nice, but if it could just add this and this car, it's nice, but if I could just put this and it's a restless soul that just has no place to just go, I am satisfied. Why? Because that's only found in Jesus. <laughs> uh, Mark Cuban, uh, after his first, by the way, Mark Cuban, um, I want to say owner of the Dallas Mavericks, but you'll have no idea who I'm talking about. Shark Tank guy. Mark Cuban. After his first billion dollars, they asked him, what was the, what was the feeling like? Like you're sitting there and he's like, explain it to me. He's going, yeah, uh, so I, it was coming up. He's like, I'm at the computer and I'm just refreshing, refreshing, refreshing. And he goes, and I refreshed it. And then my 
immediate thought was, how do I get to two? (laughs) How do I get to two? Why? Because the soul is restless. The soul is restless. Why? Because we know and we long for life. Goodness, we long. It's not like we don't want those things. Everybody wants those things. And like our culture goes, well, if you're free to do whatever you want, then you'll have complete peace and complete satisfaction. And what do we see? Man, we are more drugged up, depressed, and just messed up than ever before. To find rest for your soul. And listen, your situation is different than my situation. Like there's some of us in this room, man, our marriages are great, but we're struggling financially. There's some of us in this room, man, our finances are great, but our marriage is on the rocks. There's some of us in this room, man, we are sick, but we've got a great relationship with our kids. There's some of us in this room, we've got a terrible relationship with our kids, but we've got some health, right? And so it's not like there's a one issue that we're all facing. It's in a lot of different areas, but how do you find rest in the midst of all of that? Come to me. That's it. Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy burdened. Come to me and I will give you rest for your souls. This is the same thing that we do in communion. Communion is not a place where we hit off our to-do list and where we go, okay, well, I have to check this off and I have to check this off and I have to check this off. Communion, all we have to do when we're talking about the communion table is come. There's nothing that we have to do before we come to this table except believe in Jesus Christ But there's not, God's not going, here's what's required in order for you to come to the table. He's going, I have died on the cross in your uh, place for your sins, and all you have to do is believe, and I've given you life. And so when we look and when we take the bread, then church, what we're seeing is that Jesus broke his body so that we don't have to. And when we take the cup, then what we see is we have, Jesus has poured out his blood so that you and I don't have to. The Bible tells us that after the death of Jesus, His body remained there, they placed it in the tomb. His soul goes to Hades. It's almost as if Jesus went there so that we don't have to. Not almost as if that's what happened. Our soul, our salvation, our worship, if it's entrusted to him, it is secure in him. And so church, stand with me as we pray. as we begin to pray for the bread. And again, communion, or talking about communion, it is a time of reflection, and it is a time of remembrance. And for us to remember what Jesus has done so that you and I might have life and have it eternally. Let's pray for the bread.